All right, great to see people coming into the room. We're gonna take just another minute or so to make sure everybody can get situated and then we'll jump right into it. Thanks for being here. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks everybody for your patience. Uh, I'm Will Cross, I'm playing host today. So mostly um, I'm gonna read a couple of quick things and then get out of the way and let the main attraction take over. So thank you all for being here today. We're really excited for this session. Um, before the session starts, I had a quick statement to read on behalf of the conference. The Open Education Southern Symposium strives to offer an open, inclusive and friendly environment for all participants. All attendees are expected to help maintain a professional and welcoming environment free of any type of harassment, by being mindful of the space and the time you're taking up, by being aware of the dynamics of power and privilege that exist, by being considerate of others' desire for privacy, by being respectful of others and accepting that differences in opinion and circumstances create a stronger collaborative environment, and by actively challenging individual biases and assumptions. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and drop the code of conduct in there as well so everybody has access to it. And without further ado, I'm gonna shut up and let our wonderful presenters start speaking. So I'm so excited for the presentation. Thank you very much, Will. Um, we are very pleased to be joining you uh, what, for what is this morning um, for Are We There Yet? Narratives of Institutional Maturity and Open Educational Practices from Australian Higher Education. I'm joined by three colleagues today uh, who will be introduced as we move through the presentation. And to give you an idea of how we're going to be proceeding this morning, we're going to give an outline of the panel introduce our universities and the panelists so that you understand the context within which we are operating. And then we have deci decided to divide our time into three themes, building on existing relationships and trust, OER adoption and publishing, and funding and building communities for engagement. Each one of our three presenters will then um, finish with some concluding statements. And I certainly hope that you enjoy this insight into our universities and the way in which we are charting institutional maturity of open educational practices. So firstly, I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague, Nikki Anderson. Uh, Nikki is the Open Content Librarian at the University of Southern Queensland. It is all yours, Nikki. Thanks, Adrian. So I just wanted to give a brief snapshot of um, our campus. So the University of Southern Queensland is a young regional university dedicated to providing quality programs and degrees in a flexible and supportive environment. We provide education globally from three regional locations in southeast Queensland, Toowoomba, Springfield and Ipswich. The USQ has approximately 26,000 students, with 70% of them studying online. A combined total of 126 languages are spoken by students enrolled as part of 700 specialised courses. As a university of opportunity, we have a strong focus on first and family students, those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, rural, regional, regional and remote students, and Indigenous students. We are also one of the largest providers of education to almost 800 incarcerated students at, across 36 correctional centres across Australia. USQ is also an anchor partner of the OERU and the first university in the Southern Hemisphere to join the Open Education Network. Currently, USQ has saved students $600,000 through the use of open educational resources. I'll hand it back to you, Adrian, to now introduce Sam. Thank you very much, Nikki. So for the, uh, for the next university, um, we are going to be visiting, uh, is going to be the University of the Sunshine Coast uh, and our colleague Samantha Elkington Dent, who is the Information Officer, Copyright and Compliance. Excellent. Thanks, Adrian. 
Uh, so I'll just start with a snapshot of USC. Um, so I think if you could please go to the next slide. Oh, that's that's where we live. That's the lovely Sunshine Coast. So, um, and then one more slide. Excellent, thank you. So USC is a relatively young university. Uh, so our first campus opened on the Sunshine Coast in 1996 um, with only 500 students. Uh, today, USC has almost 18,000 students with campuses from Moreton Bay to Fraser Coast. So that's a geographical area that stretches over 200 kilometres. USC's vision is to be Australia's premier regional university. USC's aspiration has always been uh, to partner with regions as they grow and develop, to provide new capability, build capacity and to form strategic partnerships to support local success. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so our student cohort, um, USC is proud to sit above the national average for access and participation rates uh, for students from low SES backgrounds, students who identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and students with a disability. And in addition to this, almost half of our undergraduate students are the first in their family to attend university. So I'll pass back to Adrian now. And the third university being featured today is James Cook University, and that is going to be represented by Alice Lutchford, who is a liaison librarian in the disciplines of law, business, criminology, politics and creative media. Lovely. Thanks, Adrian. So this is the iconic library building that I work in on our lovely Townsville Gumtree campus in North Queensland. Our library was named after Edikoi Kimabo, a First Nations man uh, who took his fight for native title all the way to the highest court in Australia and won. Eddie had worked on our Townsville campus for many years as a gardener, and it was through many conversations with um, some history professors on campus that led to his epic legal battle, um, which went all the way to the high court um, and fought for native title and is now known as the Mabo decision. It's a real privilege to work in a library named after such a, a man. Next slide, please, Adrian. Thank you. JCU is a multi-campus university and includes main, Australian mainland and Singapore campuses. JCU is Australia's leading university in the tropics and has its main campuses on the doorstep of the World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef and Daintree Rainforest. Next slide. We have students from over 100 countries uh, represented at JCU and we were well known for our small class sizes, our student support, uh, learner engagement and social equity. In 2016, JCU became the first Australian university signatory to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals uh, with a commitment to support and promote the principles of the SDGs through our research, teaching and all our operations. Uh, to provide um, a, an overview of the JCU student cohort, uh, we have a very high proportion of our regional students uh, and we're proud to say that. Um, that many of our students live regionally in North Queensland. Um, we also have the second highest proportion of Indigenous students. 4% uh, of our students live in really remote locations uh, and 50% of our students identify as first in family and with roughly 24% of our students identifying as low socioeconomic status. Um, so as I'm sure everyone can imagine, this provides real potential for a large variety of benefits for OERs um, across our student cohort. Thanks, Adrian. So as you can see, there's a level of commonality across all three of the universities in that we are uh, very much uh, serving communities that are regional, rural and remote. We have high proportions of students who are first in family. And so as a result, uh, we face very similar challenges at all of our campuses. When we were framing this, uh, this presentation, the capability and maturity model, it was one that stood out. I've conducted previous research um, in, in marrying up the capability and maturity model and open educational practices. And for those of you who that might not be familiar with it, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction. So 
when the maturity model was first proposed, it was designed for software management processes, and they noted that it is generally through the heroic efforts of a dedicated team, rather than repeating proven methods of, of an organization with mature software processes, which means that projects, especially in the IT area, were successful. And when we were speaking about this, it's very clear that open education generally starts at an institution in a very similar manner. You have some very passionate champions who are very keen to see the benefits realized. And then as a result, it is those individuals who drive it forward. However, what we're interested in is having more robust uh, practices, because this is obviously not the way to build sustainable open educational practices that have meaningful impact. And so the maturity of the process can best be defined as the extent to which a specific process is explicitly defined, managed, measured, controlled, and effective. Now, there are five steps that an organization will proceed through uh, under this model. First of all, there is an initial or ad hoc uh, setting where this is generally chaotic and falls into this heroic efforts of passionate individuals all the way through to optimized where the level of integration within the processes of the university or the organization have become so embedded that they are now almost invisible. What we've done is within our three themes is we've considered where our universities sit on this, uh, on this uh, process. And then we're going to reflect on how that influences our decision making and how we have built up those uh, services and those relationships. The one major point of criticism about the, uh, the capability and maturity model is that whilst it is very good at providing evidence to show where one currently sits, it is completely silent on how one would move between these. So how one moves between the initial ad hoc to repeatable, um, that is where it remains mostly silent, save for the fact that you are looking for indicated criteria it doesn't provide the tools for strategic planning. And this is the gap where, where we are currently investigating. So I'm going to pass over to begin with to, um, to Alice, who will be taking the lead on building existing relationships. She will then be passing to Sam and then to Nikki. So it is all yours, Alice. Thanks, Adrian. So OER Advocacy and Development at JCU is built on trusted relationships between liaison librarians with subject discipline expertise and academics from a range of colleges and faculties. 100% of the OERs being developed in collaboration with our academic staff are directly linked to key long-term relationships between the library and academic staff. Many librarians and academic staff here have been working together for 10 to 15 years and have a foundation of trusted expertise from perspectives across both the teaching and research knowledge areas. A point of particular note is that the majority of our OERs in development are being championed by either early career or senior professorial academics. And each of these groups brings a really different perspective and drive to these projects. The key relationships extend across multiple subject disciplines at JCU. Uh, we have found that nursing, health sciences, law and humanities are really leading the way in OER development. And that can be probably directly linked to some of those really key relationships where librarians work really closely with our academic staff. Some niche areas have also been identified where our university has a real story to tell. Uh, with our academics and librarians seen as the curators or guardians of the significant local historical information here in North Queensland. Uh, some of our OERs in development include ebooks on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, Indigenous native title, North Queensland history, languages in the Pacific region, and Pacific Ocean seafaring, among others. These are just some of uh, the ones that we're currently working on. Uh, exemplar long-term project that I wanted to um, particularly mention today has been evolving over the past four years. Uh, this OER started out as a module-based libguide 
uh, with limited interactivity and has now progressed to converting that LibGuide to an open ebook hosted on the Pressbooks uh, platform that we now have. And it now has multiple integrated interactive components, including H5P activities. This has been a really exciting development for us uh, and the, the, the long-term project always wanted to have this functionality and these features, um, but unfortunately the, the LibGuide option didn't always give that to us in the past, but we now have this exciting new project to, uh, to convert to a Pressbooks ebook. The project actually now extends across two universities after one of the key academics who started this project, she actually moved to a new university but she wanted to stay connected as a real key stakeholder in this JC-led project. The project has had multiple iterations with grant funding proposals and up to 10 staff, but all the, all the while, the core underlying and binding tenant remains a really solid foundation of strong existing relationships and trust between the librarians and the academics working on this project. Now, with regard to then um, analysing our organisational maturity for this theme, we are currently tracking on a level one, uh, whereby OER collaborations are currently on an ad hoc or an individual academic or librarian champion basis, uh, as Adrian mentioned earlier. But we really do have the aim to progress this um, towards level two matur maturity with further repeatable documented procedures in place as soon as possible. So thank you and handing over to Sam. Thanks, Alice. Uh, so our experiences at USC are similar to JCU. Uh, so building on existing relationships is really a vital component for the USC library in being able to um, successfully establish and progress a culture of open practices. Uh, so since the beginning of 2020, we've actually been making headway in terms of understanding and developing the maturity of practices at our university. Uh, so during this presentation, I will draw upon our experiences over the last 18 months. And so I'm going to refer to some of the work that we've completed um, as part of our current initiative, but I'll share a bit more of this um, a bit later on. So in terms of progressing this initiative, which a component does include OER adoption, uh, this relies on leveraging those relationships um, and those existing relationships between the librarians and the academic staff is key. So one of our goals is to increase measure and understand the impact of our outreach and engagement with the academics. Um, and so I think that's where we're moving from that level one um, ad hoc kind of stage into that repeatable uh, level two stage. Um, but for us at USC, the relationships are much broader than just this one. So USC is a very cross collaborative university, um, especially when it comes to improving outcomes for our students. So there's an incredible amount of respect for people's backgrounds um, and the skill sets and knowledge that we all bring to the table. Um, and so over this 18 month period, we've really tapped into our existing networks with our colleagues in the learning and teaching unit and with student services and engagement. Uh, so these relationships are also vital because they bring important perspectives um, and understanding of issues and challenges that reach far beyond the library. So for example, student services have the expertise in access and participation, student retention and success efforts, and also understanding those barriers to study. So whether that's financial or other barriers. Um, and our learning and teaching center, of course, bring the expertise in curriculum design and pedagogy, um, but it also allows the library to integrate OER into that curriculum design process. So these relationships are mutually beneficial uh, and we can all learn and understand more about our student cohort and their needs. And we can really garner insights too into the processes and deadlines that are facing our academic staff. So I think all in all, we really can share our knowledge um, and expertise to grow our capacity and to develop our maturity in this space. So I'll now hand over to Nikki. Thanks, Sam. So at USQ, we started our open education journey by targeting academics we had positive relationships with and leveraging those relationships by encouraging them to experiment with open educational practices. At first, this meant encouraging the adoption or adaption of open educational resources. Like Alice, this process is supported by our team of liaison librarians who have strong existing relationships with deaf faculty and more engagement responsibilities in their roles. 
However, as our relationships with academics grew, some were willing to create original open textbooks and even embed open assessment within their courses. Creating open educational champions among faculty was important to us, as these champions each had their own networks and built on their own existing relationships, ultimately promoting the use of open educational resources among their peers. For us, our relationship focused approach has had a domino effect, resulting in greater awareness and open education at our university. However, we hope to keep moving forward by not only building on our existing relationships, but also forming new ones. We are currently working on extending our reach, not just only to within the faculties, but also within executives within our institution. So we are aiming to make open education a learning and teaching priority at our university. So we currently see ourselves sitting on level two of the capability maturity model, but hoping to move towards level three. So I'm gonna hand it back to Adrian to introduce the next theme. Thank you very much. So the second theme that we have is around OER adoption and publishing. And this flows on quite neatly from our leveraging um, existing partnerships and working in partnerships with a range of university stakeholders in order to see that OER are being adopted and also that we are supporting institution-wide publishing initiatives, ultimately for the benefit of our students. Now, for this one, we are going to start with with um, Sam at USC, who's going to pass over to Nikki and then to Alice. So I will pass straight over to Sam. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, so as I just mentioned before, we have been making headway um, in building capacity and in understanding, developing and increasing our maturity. Uh, so I first want to talk about OER adoption. So over the last 18 months, uh, we've made progress by firstly establishing a working party, which I'll actually go into more depth in the next theme, um, and by laying the foundations to move along that capability maturity model from that level one, so un ad hoc and also probably a bit uncoordinated in the approach uh, to that next level of maturity. So we're really aiming for repeatable, but also a documented uh, set of processes. So to do this, the library has established a framework for progressing OER with the view that these processes can be integrated into our business as usual activities. So there are several components to this framework. Uh, one of the components was to create a learning module. Uh, so catered specifically to our needs at USC and to what our librarians need to know about both OER, but also other affordable learning options, which might be available to lower the cost of study for students. Uh, so as part of this module, there's a unit on different types of licensing models offered by publishers. Uh, this learning module was created by two of our wonderful student experience librarians who analysed the information needs and the gaps. Uh, they planned and developed the content and then they made it all come to life using SharePoint Online. And because we've taken the time to develop this learning module, uh, we can use it in the future. So we might use it as new staff come on board, um, or we may even repurpose it to roll it out to academic staff. Another part of our framework was the creation of a systematic and repeatable process for identifying courses uh, for potential OER adoption or other affordable learning options uh, based on a list of priority criteria that we developed specific to our institution's context. So this process uses data from several data sources um, and includes information about course offerings, so that, such as the study period or location offering, uh, current prescribed textbooks and their prices, um, and course enrollment information such as student numbers, uh, while also taking into consideration those other elements such as the librarian's professional knowledge of a course or discipline, alignment to other strategic priorities or projects at USC, and also the academics preparedness to update the prescribed text or just the curriculum more broadly. We're also developing repeatable ways to identify OERs. So currently we have two courses where an OER has been assigned as the prescribed textbook, and we have another three where OERs have been adopted as part of the reading list for that course. Uh, finally, as part of this framework, it has also allowed us to explore different ways of working. 
Uh, so as a team, we've been integrating techniques from agile project management methodologies. So including uh, creating a Kanban board in SharePoint online and then complementing this with 15 minute uh, virtual stand up meetings every week. Um, we've also designed a survey tool to help us track changes um, in terms of OER adoption and also academics attitudes towards OERs over time. Uh, so hopefully as we gather this data, that will be another source that we'll be able to leverage in the future to make decisions um, about where we should be focusing our OER efforts. So while OER adoption has been moving forward, there has also been a growing interest in OER creation or publishing, um, specifically for us in terms of an open licensing framework, which we're in the process of um, proposing and getting support for. Uh, so this traction has actually been so recent that when I was preparing my notes, even a few months ago, um, I actually had indicated to all my co-authors that, oh, you know, USC is not even really looking at this space at the moment. Um, but things for us are moving so quick uh, that, you know, that's starting to change. So we've recently had an indication that there's possibly support from our executive for this open licensing framework, which essentially in a nutshell will involve uh, the processes and the guidance so that academic staff can use Creative Commons licenses uh, for selected learning and teaching objects. Uh, so that's still early days, but I think that there's potential there for us to be embarking on this same journey uh, for OER creation and to start moving along that capability uh, maturity model to be moving into that level two stage. So to quickly sum it up, um, in terms of that capability maturity model, our current state for OER creation is that we are still only level one, but we are hoping to be progressing towards level two. Uh, whereas for adoption, I think we're actually already moving towards uh, that level two because of these document documented processes and resources that we have been developing. So while the foundational work may seem a bit arduous, um, I think that it's necessary to be able to move through the capability maturity model and to hopefully put in place uh, those processes that will actually support OER adoption. So I'll now hand over to Nikki. Thanks, Sam. So at USQ, we have been publishing open text since 2019 using the publishing platform Pressbooks. We have currently published a open text with several more under development. Three of our open texts have been adapted from American textbooks to suit the Australian context. Currently, there are limited Australian open texts, so encouraging academics to adapt an existing text to suit the Australian context is one of our primary aims. We have also published three original open texts and one open text created by USQ students as part of their assessment. The emergence of COVID-19 has played a role in the adoption and adaption of open text at USQ due to the inability to access hard copy textbooks during lockdown. During 2020, we source open text for each course as alternatives to traditional hard copy textbooks, which couldn't be copied due to copyright restrictions. The open alternatives we provided led to an increased insight into open access options and led to the development of our first Australian biomedical open textbook. Our Google Analytics data shows that USQ produced open resources are regularly used in 103 different countries and have saved our students $600,000. One of the greatest benefits of our open textbooks is that Pressbooks allows for the books to be exported in multiple formats, ultimately allowing for flexibility of access for students, particularly those with limited connectivity. Most interestingly is the EPUB format that works on phones and tablets, as it comes with the ability to resize font and change both the font and contrast. Additionally, it allows for note-taking, bookmarking, and offers a text-to-speech function. We've had informal evidence from students who have stated they like the option of listening to the book, especially when their eyes are tired or if they're multitasking with parental duties. Initial feedback also shows that the format have no trouble with pronouncing words correctly. And whilst it's not Morgan Freeman, it's a lot better than the um, voice on your car GPS. So, so far we've received a lot of positive feedback both internally and externally from our published open textbooks. We currently see ourselves moving from a beginner OER publisher to a more experienced one. 
So we see ourselves on the level two of the capability maturity model to moving towards level three. So what we currently have to do is iron out our workloads, which have organically changed over time since we first started our publishing endeavors. So I'll now hand it over to Alice for her to talk about the OER adoption and publishing experience at James Cook. Thanks, Nikki. So JCU Open Education Initiative is a two-year pilot project to adopt, adapt and create OERs in addition to an objective for more strategic implementation of low-cost and no-cost textbooks at JCU. JCU started a Pressbook subscription in November 2020 uh, so still fairly early days for us, um, but here we are six months on and the current state of play is that we have one diploma program, which is explicitly identifying as zero textbook dollars. We have one master's program, which is expressing interest in identifying as zero textbook dollars. Uh, two known textbook adoptions uh, since November 2020, with many more in current negotiations. Uh, and we're investigating the idea of completing a full audit and analysis of prescribed textbooks across all our undergraduate degree programs at the moment. We currently have 12 OERs in production, uh, although we're yet to publish any, um, but some of these ones that we have in production at the moment include one adaption. Uh, this one um, is an original Canadian resource being adapted to an Australian edition. So similar to um, what Nikki was mentioning, uh, we saw a real um, niche um, need for um, converting some of the international resources into Australian editions. And we've got some nursing academics at JCU who are very interested in uh, helping us progress that. Uh, and we've also got 11 original OERs currently in development across a variety of disciplines. Uh, and these include um, some of the ones I mentioned earlier, um, the Reef, uh, Indigenous Native Title, Law, Humanities, uh, Languages, other health sciences areas. We have got numerous additional OERs which have been identified by librarians as suggestions for adoption um, by academic staff. Sorry about that. Um, with regard to our organisational maturity, we are currently tracking on a level two, whereby our processes are repeatable and becoming documented sufficiently such that repeating the same steps may be attempted. Uh, so similar to um, Nikki and Sam, we are very much looking forward to um, creating our better workflows and documenting our procedures and working um, more directly with that repeatable process. So thank you. And I'll hand back over to Adrian. As we've had previously, we've been building on existing relationships. We've got the OER adoption processes and also our publishing initiatives uh, that are very much starting to emerge across a number of Australian universities, not just the ones that you're seeing today. And so we're also looking at, um, in our theme three, the funding and building of communities for engagement, uh, especially at USQ, and Nikki will speak about this uh, in more depth to, to start off this theme, we are very strongly of the belief that the best way to get people to move forward and to own this process of engagement is to get them talking together, get them working collaboratively, and get them thinking about the affordances of open education and how that has a direct impact on their learning and teaching practice and also what benefits it has for their students. So in this theme, we're going to start with USQ. Nikki will be taking that, uh, heading then to Alan and then for Sam for wrapping up this theme before we move to our concluding statements. So I'll pass straight over to Nikki. Thanks, Adrian. And before I jump, um, jump in, did you want to explain the analogy of your lovely image here, Adrian? Of course, yes. Uh, now, one of the things that we use at USQ is the notion that open is everyone's business. It's one of those phrases that gets uh, repeated across the campus quite a bit. And one of the images that uh, I use in a lot of my engagement with staff is this one of the Canadian geese. Now, for those of you that, that might not be aware, when Canadian geese are migrating, what happens is one of them will take the lead and it does the hard work of breaking the air 
airflow and making things easier for the rest of the flock behind it. But eventually leading is, is tiring. It takes a lot of effort and energy. And eventually what will happen is the lead uh, goose will fall back and another one will take its place and it will expend energy in uh, making things easier and smoother for the rest of the flock. We've used this analogy quite a bit at USQ where what I've said is that at every point along the way for adaption, adoption, uh, around uh, looking at how our impact is tracked, we have different leaders across the university. And so at any given point, it could be myself, Nikki, it could be a member of the academic staff, it could be a librarian, a learning designer, a learning technologist, or any number of staff who are currently involved in OER. And so that's why we're using this analogy, the idea that we are all leaders in some way, and that we all take turns at the leadership process in order to break new barriers and to be able to get open moving forward smoothly. So I'll pass over to Nikki. Thanks, Adrian. So USQ has provided open educational grants since 2015. So our grants are explicitly aligned with our social justice strategic action plan. Applicants need to articulate how their work contributes to the university by meeting one or more of the following pillars. A culturally supportive learning space for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, an inclusive learning environment that facilitates higher education attainment, a socially responsible university that provides opportunity for social mobility and graduates whose abilities have been developed through opportunities provided by USQ. The point of differentiation when compared nationally and internationally is that our grants are based on support and the development of a supportive, inclusive community. Our grants program is a safe space for staff to collaborate within a community of learning that focuses on using open educational practices to meet the educational needs of students. This support is built in even before an awardee is successful, as all applicants for the grant can ask for a coach who walks with them during the application process, provides feedback, assist with refining and extending ideas, and connecting them with staff who may have similar interests and skills. The Open Grants community is connected between monthly gatherings, as well as through an online Moodle space. At each monthly gathering, we celebrate wins, meet to build upon our discipline knowledge in open education, and lend assistance when community members encounter barriers or challenges to their practice. We pose the same three questions to our community members each month. What have we achieved? What will we learn? And what are we planning to do? Our community model is based on Michael Thorne's theory of educational change, which means we provide those within the community the space and permission to experiment and innovate, high levels of support, and encouragement to own the process of change and their own practice. If we could jump to the next slide, Adrian, please. This naturally positions these staff as leaders in open education who can mentor and encourage change within other staff. This has been an evident pattern through our grants program. In fact, we have noticed numerous staff have returned for multiple grants and they have always brought new staff into the community of engagement. This is mentorship and action and a form of distributed leadership. Additionally, involvement in the grants community has opened up other opportunities for staff involved, including winning more grants, being offered speaking or consultancy opportunities, and assisting academics in their promotion. So since 2015, our grants community has engaged 57 staff from 12 discipline areas. So I thought I'd take a moment to show you what some of our community members have said about our open education community of practice. So on the next slide, one academic says, as a new academic, I arrived at the University of Southern Queensland in 2016 after a 20 year career in Queensland schools. The considerable pressures on academics to research, teach and engage with the community initially made any embrace of innovation difficult. It was easy to become immersed in how things were being done rather than explore how they could be done and indeed how they should be done. The OER community provided a framework to be an agent of change rather than merely react to the many details 
but dominant in average workday as an academic. It was not, however, always about technique and format. The real value for me was the encouragement to view things differently. It was about challenging a mindset about the nature of a textbook and by my extension, my own pedagogy. So on the next slide, another academic said, the best part of the grant has been the collaborative nature of the community that has sprung up around the grants. It is rare to find academics working together to encourage and support each other during the time of the grant and then returning each year with new people to share the benefits. This is a point of difference in our community. We care about the success of all grant recipients, not just our own success. We share our wins and challenges and others are always there to support us. And finally, one member concluded, I have not felt that level of support in any job that I've ever had in my whole life. And so I think this really highlights the power of support and community in advancing open educational practice. So I'm now gonna hand it back to Alice to share the JCVU experience. Thanks, Nikki. So the JCU Open Education Initiative started in March 2021. Uh, it initially has been cost neutral with no funding allocated for grants or implementation, unfortunately. Um, the library is taking the lead in this initiative though, with input from the academy, our learning and teaching and student engagement teams. Uh, our Pressbooks subscription was successfully advocated for by the library director. Uh, and it was facilitated by the JCU Division of Student Life, of which the library is one of three directorates. At a community level, the JCU Open Education Special Interest Group is uh, a new initiative that we've set up to meet monthly, and it consists of library staff, learning advisors, ed designers, and so on, with a view to including academic staff in the future. The way we've organised the monthly special interest group meetings are that we have Zoom webinars, which are then supportive of the one JCU policy, which is um, across all of our campuses. Uh, and we do, yeah, we have a Microsoft Teams space, which actually allows the day-to-day -day collaboration as well. We find that the monthly meetings are very enjoyable and um, participative, and everyone enjoys getting together, um, similar to um, how Nikki was describing, very supportive and very sharing and caring. So for this particular theme, um, with regard to our organisational maturity, we are currently tracking on a level one in this area as well, whereby we are still in that initial ad hoc phase, still coming up with ideas, still trying to reach out to many colleagues across campuses and bring everyone together. We're certainly hoping to capitalise on individual successes and early adopters in this space, and we're looking for champions in this area. So, thanks. For that, um, just passing over to Sam. Thanks, Alice. Uh, so at USC, we have no dedicated funding for any open education initiatives. Uh, so, you know, we don't have, we can't get a subscription to a platform like Pressbooks, for example. Um, so we're essentially doing everything from existing resourcing. Of course, this isn't ideal or sustainable over the longer term. But I think for the moment, the focus has really been on proving value and establishing those foundations so that we can demonstrate what would be possible in the future. So in terms of this theme, our focus is very much on the building communities aspect. Um, and the example I'd like to draw on is our working party. So I briefly mentioned that in the last theme. Uh, so we established a cross-department OER working party back in April, 2020. And this group has membership from the library, the information services systems team, the learning and teaching unit and student services and engagement. So this is the group that's been really instrumental in completing the groundwork for our current initiative. Uh, our primary motivation has been very much on the student experience, which has been the key driver for focusing on affordability issues. So as a group, we determined that direction that we would take. And so given our student cohort and our strategic goals at the university. Uh, this was the most logical starting point for us to become more acquainted with how OERs could actually work within our university. So now that this initial work has been done, there are plans currently uh, to evolve this group. So the intention at the moment is to morph this current group into a learning network, uh, possibly more similar to like what Alice described. 
Um, and as part of this, we'll look at the scope. We will look at expanding uh, probably to open education more broadly rather than just OER and affordability. Um, and we'll also review the membership and hopefully open it up um, and with the intention of involving academic staff and possibly even students. Um, to complement this, we're also in the process of proposing a higher level working group that um, could report to one of our USC committees. Um, and if we're successful, this would give OERs greater visibility. So I think our greatest success has been creating a shared vision with teams outside of the library. And I'll pass back to Adrian. As you've seen across all three of the themes, you've got a consistent narrative across these regional universities. Essentially, we're very early stages of OER adoption, and that is reflective of a national and sector-wide uh, situation where we have got constraints in Australia, especially around things like copyright law, which is in great need of a, a very large overhaul. And we have advocates working at the federal level and have been for a couple of decades to try and get our copyright laws to be um, somewhat more consistent with the values of universities um, and also to support their societal role. Uh, what I would say about the national environment in general in Australia is that we have these pockets, these core pockets of really good practice that are really emerging over probably about the last five years. Last year, when we saw national level lockdowns due to COVID-19, this really highlighted the systemic inequality that our students uh, face on a daily basis. And it was during this time time that when university campuses were closed and access to physical collections in our campus libraries was non-existent, it meant that we needed to find different ways of approaching how we resource our courses at each institution. Now, Nikki mentioned that at USQ, part of that was to go through course by course for over the, the 700 courses that we offer and to um, interact with those lecturers and provide them with potential alternatives that students could um, access. What we did find was during that period of time, uh, our academic staff started to realise a lot more about how much a university budget is impacted by proprietary publishers and by commercial publishers and how much we can actually pay for some of our uh, textbooks. In some cases, our uh, textbooks that we were trying to get access to for students were going to cost us anywhere between three and fifty $15,000 per title, and that was for a yearly subscription. In some disciplines, especially disciplines such as law, we found that those costs were skyrocketing well into the $20,000 mark for an individual title. This has provided a really good catalyst, and so the environment is now really much at the point where we're exploring things at a national level in how we can leverage open educational resources and extend that into open educational practices. So I'm hoping that what we've given you is a snapshot of, well, three out of the 42 universities in Australia today and really where we're at. I'm also hoping that what we've given you is um, some ideas that you can take back to your own institutions. However, we're going to conclude with a few thoughts from each one of our panellists and to and in order to do that, I'll pass back over and they're going to give three or four observations, some ideas that you can take away from this session and maybe use at your own institutions if you are in a very similar, um, if you're in a similar environment. So first of all, we have Sam. Oh, sorry, no, we do not. We have Alice. Thanks, Adrian. Um, and just very conscious of the time too, um, I believe we've been opening up to questions now as well. So I'll just quickly say that um, we've yeah, really enjoyed working with the other universities in Australia. And I love Adrian's analogy of the Canadian geese that has inspired us over the last um, 12 months or so on our journey of, in this OER space. We are hoping to move to high levels of organisational maturity 
to help realise many of the benefits of OERs for our staff and students. Um, the library is linking um, to our strategic plan to incorporate key operational targets to help us mobilise the OER initiative at JCU. Uh, and we're also looking to develop some key measurable impacts to further advocate for OER adoption, adaption and creation. And we've been really interested in following Adrian and Nikki's path there in um, understanding some of the, the Google analytics and so on, and some of the data and the metrics that are coming out of the, uh, their research and work at USQ. So thank you, USQ, for being such great leaders in this space. Um, and we really look forward to working at a more national level with all of the universities in Australia and beyond. So passing over to Sam, thank you. Thanks, Alice. Uh, so yes, I'll try to keep this very quick. So I guess what I wanted to say is that it's never too late to start building OEP or OER capacity and interest at your institution. Uh, so even if you feel like you're behind, chances are you're not, you know, you should, should get started no matter where you're at. Um, I would recommend assessing your institution's maturity. You could use something like that capability maturity mo model. Um, envision the future state and then develop actionable goals for how you will get there. And I think that understanding your institution's culture is really important. So thinking about where could you get traction? Is it in adoption or creation, um, affordable learning initiatives, the diversity and inclusion aspect, or maybe even open pedagogy? So I don't think that there's a one size fits all model uh, for this space. So um, yeah, there's lots of great opportunities uh, to move forward. So I'll pass to Nikki now. Thank you. Um, the key thoughts from Adrian and I are just to support, celebrate and promote each other um, in the work in the open education space linked to strategic plans such as learning and teaching plans or social justice plans like linked to the border initiatives of the university. Um, encourage and support staff to become visible open education champions and support staff to engage with the scholarship of teaching and learning about their practice. Um, so that's been really impactful for us, especially in the grants program. So now I hand it back to Adrian just to wrap up. Thanks very much. And I wanted to thank the, um, the, the team here at the symposium for the opportunity to present this morning and also to thank all of the, the panelists today as I hand back over to Will. And you'll find all of our contact details uh, in case you wanted to get in contact with any of us on your screen at the moment. Thank you all so much for a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot and I'm really inspired by the great work that you're doing. Uh, we, we got started a few minutes late, so we're, we're a few minutes over time now. But if, if there are any questions, I'm sure uh, we'd love to, to discuss those. So feel free to add them in the chat or unmute and ask them now. I'll, I'll ask a, a question that's been on my mind while other folks are sort of formulating it, which is I spend a lot of time thinking about copyright in open education in particular, and you all mentioned that. Um, I'm curious if you have found that to be sort of a unique barrier to the work that you've been doing, or does the fact that so much of the work is built on Creative Commons licensing alleviate a lot of that tension for you? Did you want to start with that one, Sam? Sure, I don't mind answering that. Um, as as the copyright officer at USC. Um, I can't kind of speak maybe more so to that um, creation side of things. That's probably something that Nikki would probably have something to say about. I think from the adoption perspective, what's interesting about Australian copyright law um, that Adrian kind of touched on is just, there's been a lot of people advocating for many, many years and decades about reforms to Australian copyright law um, often with little success in that space. So I think that if anything, that very restrictive copyright law where we, where we don't have what, what you have in the States with fair use is probably something that actually drives OER adoption because people see OER as a perfect way to deal with some of those copyright barriers and issues that we have um, in our law in Australia. Did you have anything to um, add, Nikki? Yeah, I absolutely agree. And um, especially at USQ, um, 
for an incarcerated student who don't have access to the internet, we can't provide them with um, journal articles from our databases and like even really the simple stuff that all other students have. So it really becomes an equity issue. And so copyright is a huge barrier and it is, it is a massive driver for us adopting and publishing OER or USQ. Great, thank you both. That's, that's really helpful. Are there any, are there any other questions? I know you all are, are just having your morning coffee and so many of our attendees are, are sort of at the end of their day and, and wobbling on their feet a little. So. Well, if there are no other questions now, we've got your contact information here. So, so watch out on Twitter or by email. Questions may come in there as well, um, as, especially as folks watch the recording and, and sort of catch up a little bit. Thank you all for this really, really exciting question. I've, I've really enjoyed the discussion that you've had and the, the great ideas that you've shared. And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much again for the opportunity, Will. It's been absolutely great to be here. So much. So I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>